الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على منة الولاية وكفى بها منة وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد والرسول المسدد والمصطفى الأمجد والمحمود الأحمد حبيبي إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين سفن النجاة الأعلام من ركب سفينتهم نجا ومن تخلف عنها هلك وغرق ثم أما بعد Respected elders, brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh We are continuing from where we left from yesterday and we were still talking in regard to point number four of the discussion on religion which speaks about that religion gives an aid to progress of science and knowledge and we were talking about this at length until we were caught up with time and I had to wrap up my speech uh, yesterday and I left you at the following point of discussion where we said that this attitude towards cosmos undoubtedly stimulates when you put the religious perspective to it that the attitude of religion towards the cosmos undoubtedly stimulates persistent stimulates persistent thinking over the mechanism of creation and consequently helps in the advancement of science and knowledge in contrast we would hold that this universe is the product of she mechanical factors having no intellect there remain no plausible reason then why we should make strenuous effort to discover its secret so basically what we are saying if this particular universe came of its own then we don't need to understand it because it doesn't make any logic right if the universe came of its own then there is no reason to explore it because it makes no sense but when you see the she systematic painstaking organizational pattern of the world that we live in and how everything runs to proportion then surely you would sit and ponder or stand and ponder and say how is it possible that something that comes from nothing is so meticulous and so immaciable and so perfect in every sense of the word if it was not created by someone who has put it in such a meticulous proportioned amazing immaculate way of running and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna kulla shay'in khalaqnahu biqadar everything we created in this world was created to proportion huh? it is not haphazardly or an, an ad hoc basis that things came together and that's the end of the story in principle a universe which is the outcome of the working of an unconscious machinery can neither be well designed nor mysterious every day we are discovering something about this universe of ours every day the Hubble telescope tells us we found a new Milky Way we found a new I don't know what we found a new Sun we found a new moon we found a new planet as 10 million times bigger than our planet and you sit and wonder how is that possible that these things came about by themselves I'm reminded of a story of a scholar at the time of the Imams where an atheist challenged him to in as far as the existence of God is concerned right and I want to advise my youth community those who go to colleges those who come encounter with first-hand hardcore atheist when they drop the bombshell question prove to me that God exists I say to our youth the question itself is wrong 
right? You must say to the atheist, if you want me to prove to you that God exists, let's correct the question first. Prove to me that God does not exist. That's the right question. Because as far as the existence of God is concerned, I have no problem. You have a problem. I don't have a problem. Your problem now is to prove the non-existence of God. And I'm reminded in that regard, for those who are interested in the subject, is to um, uh, uh, YouTube. I think it is available on YouTube. The debate that happened between the learned brother of mine, Hassanan Rajab Ali, if you know him, and Don Barker. And see how when they were coming together to debate the question of the existence of God, Hassanan Rajab Ali, may Allah bless him, he emphasized that I will not agree to a debate that starts with the question, does God exist? The title of the debate should be, does God not exist? Huh? Does God not exist? It's not, does God exist? Right? You have to, the onus of proof is on those who are in denial. Not on those who are already in acceptance of the fact of the presence of an omnipotent God who knows what is happening and what's going on around the world. So much so that he had produced and pinned down for us a universe that no one can question its miraculous running and its perfect being in the way we have been examining the world at hand. In principle, therefore, we say a universe which is the outcome of a working of an unconscious machinery can neither be well designed nor mysterious. Apart from giving a deadly blow to the advancement of science and knowledge, such conception of the cosmos negates the very fact that man's instinct is basically rooted in religion. Albert Einstein was very true when he pointed out why great thinkers and discoverers are interested in religion. But what sort of religion? The religion that is based on logic. That's why sometimes, you know, people could not relate to the religiousness of Albert Einstein. Because his way of viewing religiousness and Godness, if I can say this term, is different to the way we actually relate to the existence of a God and the existence of a religion. He said that it was hard to find anyone among the great thinkers. These are his words. Among the great brains of the world who might not have a sort of religious feeling peculiar to him. That feeling was different from the religion of the man in the street. Because the religion of the man of the street is based around rituals. But the religiousness of an intellectual being is revolved around the intellect. Just like the Quran pinned out that particular argument when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a, a mind-blowing ayah in the Quran when he said to the Qurayshis or the Meccans of the time and he said that to the Prophet initially when he told him, Oh Muhammad, tell the Meccans فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ You must learn intellectually that there is no God but Allah. It is not a matter of blind faith. Believing in Allah is not a matter of blind faith. You must learn intellectually that God exists. And you must put your mind to the challenge in as far as that issue is concerned. It has the form. He's talking the religiousness of an intellectual thinker has the form of a delightful wonder at the marvelously accurate system of the universe which from time to time unveils its secrets in comparison with which all organized human thinking and research are rather weak and stale to appreciate and understand.
You know, only a weak mind cannot ponder and understand the miraculous creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But a great thinking mind, when it stops and ponders of the universe, it says, surely there is a maker to this universe. You know, a man came to debate with a scholar once. And he said to him, the atheist, the story I wanted to relate to you. And he said to him that I don't believe in God. You prove to me the existence. He said, no problem. Tomorrow we'll meet you at the other side of the Euphrates. You know, the Euphrates River in Iraq. Because that alim was living in Iraq. So he, he said, no problem. I'll meet you. So that person came and waited for the scholar to arrive because the scholar had to come by a boat from the other side of the river. So he came, the atheist waited at sunset, half an hour, one hour. He said, see, Muslim time. Muslim time. It's unfortunate that when we talk to one another, what do we say, Muslim time or English time? Shame on us Muslims. Shame on us Muslims that we use this and the most shameful we have among ourselves is the word insha'Allah. Insha'Allah according to Muslim means what? It will never happen. Hmm? Maulana, can you visit us? Insha'Allah. Kiss Maulana goodbye. Huh? You're not gonna see Maulana at all, unfortunately. While insha'Allah, from an Arabic perspective, an Islamic perspective, is what? Is an emphasis on the action. Yani, if nothing holds me back, with the will of Allah, I'll show up. Huh? But our insha'Allah is, I hope it was 50-50, it's not even 30-70. You know, which is very unfortunate. And we take pride in English time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'mineen kitaban mawkuta. Prayer has been appointed at a set time. Why? Because Allah wants us to be organized. Imam Ali, that we cry for day and night when we remember the way he was martyred when he calls on his, imam, on his sons, Imam Hassan and Hussein, to give them his last will. What does he say? He says, I remind you and advise you to remain conscious of Allah. Good? Usikuma bi Allah, Which is all Imams begin their wasiya with. And then he says what? What do you think the most important thing the Imam would introduce as a concept after saying to his children, remain conscious of Allah? You would think it would be Salah, right? Which is very important. Those who are negligent of their Salah, brothers and sisters, they have a deep ideological vacuum within them. Because they cannot connect to their Creator. And if you cannot connect to your Creator, you cannot, you are batteryless. Hmm? A car runs on energy. Your means to energy is that divine connection between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved three things from this life. Three things. Qal, ahbabtu min dunyakum thalath. I love from this world of yours three things. Atibu, shuti, what is the perfume? For those who never touch perfume, huh? Imam Jafar al-Sadiq Salamullah alayhi says, spending a thousand dollars in perfume will not be considered israf. Why? Because Muslims should always smell good. Go to the mosques of Muslims. God help you, brother. God help you. Which is really unfortunate. Really unfortunate. That the house of God is neglected when it comes to perfume. We don't give regard to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of cleanliness, in terms of perfuming, in terms of tib, in terms and terms and terms and terms and terms. Right? And the Prophet says, I love perfume. Number two, bombshell. Woman. But in what sense, woman? Not in the sense of marrying once, with twice, with three times. Just like the case with men. The moment he becomes rich, the first thought that comes to mind is what? 
woman number two. Eh? Because now he can afford her. Eh? Now he can choose among the array of women whom he wants to marry. But when he was wretched and he doesn't have a penny, he was trying to be, please, just be happy with me, to his first wife. But when the money starts rolling in, eh, the sky is the limit when it comes to women. All right. The Prophet didn't love women from that perspective. The Prophet loved women from the perspective of giving them the due right. Just like he showed us through his experience and interaction with his daughter, Sayyidah Zahra, Salamullahi Alayhi. What respect Rasulullah used to give to Az Zahra so that we can use this as an example in our life. She was the last person the Prophet would greet goodbye when he left Medina. And the first woman he would greet when he comes back to Medina. Why? So that the image of a Zahra will never leave his mind. In honoring the status of woman. He is the one who came into a society that used to kill women alive. And he brought a legislation that echoes until the day of judgment that reads in Surah Al-A'la. Huh? What does it read? وَإِذَا الْمَوْ... Sorry, Surah Al-Takweer. وَإِذَا الْمَوْعُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ When the infant girl shall be asked on the day of judgment, for what sin was she buried alive? And in today's world, we have a different interpretation also of that ayah. That interpretation remains alive because until now we have a problem with women bearing children as females as a first child. Right or wrong? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ أَيَمْسُكْهُ عَلَى هُونًا أَمْ يَدُسُّهُ فِي التُّرَابِ أَلَا سَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? He said when someone is given the glad tidings of, an, uh, of a female girl, what happens to him? What happens to him? His face remain angry. Huh? What should he do in front of people? Should he hold that baby in humiliation? Or should he bury that lay, uh, baby alive? Allah says, worse is your judgment of injustice. Worse is of your outlook on the woman gender. And you know, please don't misunderstand me when I speak about this because I've been hearing stories about myself and I thank the people who are telling these things about me because I need all this hasanat, wallah. Huh? So speak as much as you want about me. Huh? He says, Sheikh is the woman Sheikh. He doesn't talk about men's rights. People have been talking about men's rights for 1400 years ago. This is the only time, the only months we have been speaking about women's rights. So let's the scale tip a little bit. Once in our life, I'm no one's sheikh. I am communicating the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in ajriya illa ala Allah. I only seek my reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. So to, don't take it to heart. Inshallah, if I come next month or next year or whatever the case, it will be 50 men, 50 women. Inshallah. All right? But we need to, to uh, uh, deal with this situation at hand so we can resolve these issues. Taib, what is the modern interpretation of burying our daughters alive when we force them into a marriage they don't want to? Hmm? When we force them into a marriage they don't want to be in, we are killing the life of our daughters alive. Someone, a lady came to Rasulullah and she said, Ya Rasulullah, my father married me against my will. I want to divorce my husband. He said, has he paid you anything in mahar? She said, yes, he gave me a whole orchard. He said, are you willing to give it back to him? He said, I don't want it. Let him take it, but divorce me, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet brought the man. The Prophet is an authority. He said, you know what? The marriage is null and void because she was married against her will. And she doesn't want you. She wants a divorce. The woman, when the Prophet, she saw the Prophet acting so determined about this issue. She said, Ya Rasulullah, I love my husband. Huh? 
What's the story? One minute you don't want your... She said, no, 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 Ya Rasulullah. You know why I said this? So that when women comes after me, they know they have right in Islam. Subhanallah. So they will not be taken for granted. So they will not be taken for granted. I'm not trying to create a revolution here, brothers and sisters. Huh? I'm not asking for the divorce rate to increase. I'm trying to create a balance so that when our younger generation grow, let us raise them to the standard of Muhammad wa al Muhammad. Salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. And let us remember that the only way we can come to a point where we can break these cultural differences is if we look at the life of our Imam Salamullah and see whom did they marry? Whom did they marry? I was in Dar es Salaam once and two young people came to me <coughs> arguing about what one of them is telling the other person that Imam al Kadhim or Imam al Sadiq, one of them, I'm not 100% sure. He was dark. He had dark features. The other one says, if one of our Imams had dark features, I don't want to be a Shia anymore. I said, what sort of nonsense is this? You know why? Because the wife of Imam Sadiq was in fact a, from the inner side of the Moroccan desert. He married someone from the Moroccan and she was, uh, they call it uh, uh, Nubians. And the Nubians are very dark. He said, no, I don't want to. Another example of how intermarriages should take place regardless of culture. The mother of our current Imam, what is she? Pakistani? Lebanese? Iraqi? Italian? Oh, bombshell. Nargis Khatun is an Italian? Yes, yeah, she was an Italian princess who came to Baghdad or to Iraq and converted and married Al Imam Al Askari and gave birth to Imam Al Mahdi. What a bombshell. Nargis is Roman. Salamullah ala Nargis. Huh? We must understand these things, brothers and sisters, and know what our history is all about. Huh? Imagine if a Rivet comes to marry our daughters. Oh. God help the daughter, or God help the rivet himself, what's going to happen to him, right? I remember a story in Australia, a rivet, not a rivet, an Australian young man, beautiful Australian young man, became close to a very, you know, traditionalist Lebanese Muslim girl. They met at work. So that girl was taught one thing by her father. Don't wear hijab. Don't do anything that Islam tells you, but when it comes to marry, you have to marry a Muslim. Ah, alhamdulillah, at least something good. All right? So this girl, every time this person proposes to her, listen, I, I, I respect you, I like you, you are very cute, but I can't marry you because you have to be a Muslim. This guy thought, thought, they said, okay, they said, you know what? Let me meet your father and let me see what this faith is all about. She said, okay, she told her father, this guy wants to meet you, uh, bring him along. He came. He said, he started visiting the family and he said to the father, if I study Islam and I become a Muslim, after realizing that it's a good faith, do you promise to give me your daughter in marriage? He said, yes. But go and study Islam. So the boy started studying Islam, that a Muslim woman should wear hijab, that a Muslim woman should be modest, that a Muslim woman should be respectful, that a Muslim woman should not drink, that I'm, oh, 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 this is Islam, 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 Islam. It took him six months. After that, he came home. He shook hand with his supposedly father-in-law to be. He said, you know what, dad to be, thank you for telling me I will not let you marry your daughter until I become a Muslim. And now I have become a Muslim. The father said, oh, alhamdulillah, now we can have the marriage. That young Australian boy said, I'm no longer interested because your daughter is not the ideal Muslim wife that I want. She's not the ideal Muslim wife I want. I want someone that knows Allah before she knows her world. Subhanallah. And these type of people are saying, ah, I doubt his faith. Without his faith, you know the journey that people go through to become Muslims? You are born Muslims. Huh? We are born by an ID card that says religion, Muslim. But what do I know about my Islam? Sometimes nothing, nothing. And that's the dilemma sometimes that we face. So we need to break these rituals at hand and encompass 
us the world that we are living in. This feeling illuminates the path of life and efforts of a scientist as he gains success and honor. It keeps him free from the dead weight of selfishness and pride. What a belief in the system of the universe and what a fascinating desire it was, he adds, this is Einstein is talking, that enabled Kepler and Newton to suffer for years in isolation and in complete silence in order to simplify and explain the laws of gratification and planetary motion. No doubt it is this very religious feeling. Newton is saying this. This religious feeling that enabled the self-sacrificing and self-effacing men through long centuries in spite of their apparent defeats and failures to rise on their feet again and make a fresh start because their understanding of religion was different to that on the street. Huh? This is the religion that Islam brought forward. The contemporary scientist Abethany says that science for its own perfection should regard faith in God as one of its accepted undisputed principles. Subhanallah. Not to dismiss God of the formula and say God does not conform with science. Yes, the God of those who want God to be a myth or based on superstition or based on culture or based on tradition is the God that these scientists cannot affiliate with because it hinders their progress scientifically but when it comes to the God of Islam and the God of the world the real God Allah says the sky is not the limit Ya ma'ashar al-jinni wal-ins In istata'tum an tanfudhu min aqtar al-samawati wal-ard Fanfudhu la tanfudhu illa bi sultan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says O jinn and men, gather your forces together and try to penetrate the horizon if you are able to and if you are not able to you will not be able to unless you have an authority what did our, our Mufassirin of the Quran interpret authority here to be? They said knowledge. Knowledge that makes you penetrate through the horizon in order to explore this universe that we are living in. Thus, a religious man following the true teaching of religion can what? Can more than anybody else carry out research and discover the secrets of nature. You know when, what's his name, this first man on, on the moon? What is his name? Not Armstrong, there is another one who went with him. John No, no. What's his name? Is there another one? There is someone who went to the moon when he was asked, What did you see? I think, yeah, Neil Armstrong. Ahsan. Neil Armstrong. Subhanallah, I'm not with it today. Neil Armstrong, the tongue twister name. Uh, when he went to the moon, they asked him, What did you see? He said, I saw nothing but God. Nothing but God. Subhanallah. And when Imam Ali was asked, How do you see God? I say, he said, Every time I looked at anything, I saw God with it, above it, and in it. Subhanallah. Everything. I look at this pole. I look at this light. I look at the human being. I see Allah in it, with it, and above it. Why? Because the, song, the, the concept of God entails what? The concept of God entails giving me the intelligence to explore and dive into the world I'm living in in order to explore the secrets of His creation. And when I do, I see God in everything. I see God in everything around me. In the atheist, I see God. In the believer, I see God. 
In the non in the Hindu I see God. In the Buddhist I see God. Because God does not know colors or religion. Everyone under the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything. And please don't misquote me from the member. Alright? I know exactly what I'm talking about. Right? And if I said certain things yesterday, please don't take them out of context. When I explain the opinion of Sheikh Al Mufid, for example, about the sun, I'm not saying you are bound to follow the opinion of Sheikh Al Mufid. You want to work on the premises of Ihtiyat Wajib or Ihtiyat Mustahab according to the different jurists, that is your derogative. That is your opinion. That is your taqlid. I'm not here to change your taqlid system. Right? So don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. When I, am, when I express an opinion, I'm expressing an opinion so that when we come across it, we don't find it difficult to accept. But at least to lend it our thought and see how we can reconcile these different, uh, different or various opinions of our jurists and our learned scholars of the past and of today. So I'm not saying something new. I'm saying that these opinions existed. You are at liberty to explore it and accept it. You are at liberty to reject it. That's number one. Number two. This is something personal, or this is something I felt, and I'm not also enforcing my opinion on anyone. The biggest investment, brothers and sisters, you can do is to invest in our youth. And there is no better investment than investing in our students. Today, I took my turban out of respect to the students of Al Murtada school. I visited that school this morning and by Allah the question I got from these students were mind-boggling to the level of intelligence that these students have. One of the questions that one of the younger students asked me, he said, Sheikh, what does Allah say when we are stuck in a situation where we cannot change the status quo that we are facing. And he said, for example, what is happening in Pakistan today. Can we migrate and gain power and come back to change the situation in Pakistan? Will Allah look at us as escapers if we leave our country to gain momentum and learn more sciences so that we can benefit this country we are living in. I said, you know what, young boy, I love you. I really love you. And I love your intelligence and the way you are looking at the world. And I said, you know what, God has already answered your question. When those people that the malaika come to, the, to take their lives, their souls, they will ask them, what position were you in in this life? This is an ayah in the Quran. They say we were persecuted in this world. What will the malaika say? Ah, so you are mustad'afeen. It's okay. Allah will forgive you. Right? You were weakened. You were oppressed. No, the malaika will say, wasn't God's land so vast to migrate into it? Wasn't it vast to go and leave the zulm and the oppression you are under? Go and gain momentum and come back and liberate your zulm and your persecutors from the shackles of injustice, you know, and bring some change into these countries. Brothers and sisters, knowledge does not know any color and where it comes from. Knowledge, Rasulullah says, and I want to beg anyone to tell me, why did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say to us, seek knowledge even if you have to travel where to come? Did he? To Najaf? No. To China. What is there between us and the Chinese? What affinity do we have with the Chinese? Do we know them? 
Are they our cousins? Do we relate to them? No, we don't know them. But there are three perspectives why the Prophet said travel even, you know, seek knowledge even if you have to travel to China. Number one, it was the furthest destination known to the Arabs. So the Prophet is saying, if it requires you to travel to the end of the world, then it is worth it. Number two, Chinese are not Muslims. So knowledge does not know religion. When you want to seek knowledge, seek it from anyone as long as it is good. As long as it is good knowledge and beneficial knowledge, then seek it from wherever it comes from. Number three, the Chinese are known for mysticism. Confucius. They're very highly spiritual. And Islam endorses spirituality and contemplation. Right? Three dimensions to why China was brought into the picture. And you know what the Prophet says after that? He said, Al Hikmatu Dalatul Mu'min, Huwa Awla Biha Haisuma Wajadaha. The wisdom, knowledge, is the lost property of a Mu'min. He is more worthy of it wherever he finds it. Wherever he finds it, he finds a piece of knowledge in a Jewish person, take it. In a Christian, take it. In a Buddhist, take it. You are more worthy of it because you can share it with the rest of the world. And you can advance the world wherever it comes. Brothers and sisters, invest in your institution. If we compare the institution of knowledge in Karachi, which has been built and sustained by the community, you would become the pride of the Muslim world in terms of what you have. And you should never, never undermine your abilities to building such institutions. May Allah bless you, bless your support, bless your money. Increase it multifold because that's the only way we can invest in our children. Number five, fight against discrimination. Religion comes to fight against discrimination, not to instill discrimination. You know, there was a story that happened between two companions where someone told another companion, you are a son of a black woman. So that companion became offended. Why are you calling my mother a black woman? Do, have I had anything to do with her? <laughs> Did I make her black? Why you are making me guilty for what my mother is? I have no control over her, right? God created her. Why are you saying me not worthy of being a good person because or on account of my mother? So what happened? That companion was extremely upset by his brother companion. So when that companion realized that, by the way, the one who was called the son of a black woman was Bilal, he became very offended. So what happened? The companion who said to him, you are the son of a black woman, when he realized how much hurt he had caused his brother, he made a vow. Guess what the vow was? That Bilal should step over his neck over the neck of that companion so that he can compensate for this statement. Bilal refused. <laughs> he said, no, you are an honorable human being. If you slipped a word, I will not reciprocate by making such a gesture against you. I'm not going to humiliate you by stepping over your leg or over your neck. So they arbitrated the Prophet. They arbitrated the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. The Prophet said, you should leave this fanaticism. It's not befitting for Muslims to use these terms with one another. Don't bring this type of language among you. One of the hukuk that Imam Zain al abidin speaks about in Risalat al hukuk the treatise of right, he says what? Haqqul lisani alayk. The right of your tongue on you. Ajeeb. My tongue has a right on me? Yes. Imam Zain al abidin he says, you know what? You must compel it to always say something good. Compel it. You must familiarize it 
with what is best. <coughs> hmm? And you must keep obscenity away from using that language on your tongue. Don't abuse people. Huh? Don't use swearing words and obscene words. Don't go to Facebook and say LMAO. Hmm? You know what I'm talking about, young people? You know, huh? You know what I'm talking about. Just to fit in Facebook culture. Right? Why? What's wrong with L A L O L? Laughing out loud. What's wrong with that? Why do I have to go to the L A M O for? Just to fit or to show the rest of the world that I am what? Modern. That I have no regard for language. Right? That I can see anything, I say anything I want. Because I'm a liberal human being. Huh? I can say the SH word. Man, I'm sorry to say this. It smells bad. Sounds bad. Looks bad. Tastes bad. Right? But instead, when you get angry, why don't you say sugar? Looks good. Tastes good. Smells good. And does you good. Right? Change your language. Huh? You become a pioneer in what you say. Let others follow you. Don't follow others. You create your own culture of language. Right? Because when you create that culture of language, you create peace among the world as well. You don't create hatred and animosity among the people. Right? So the Prophet came said, don't use this type of language among yourself. I'm past my time. I will conclude soon. <coughs> so what happened? The Prophet wants to dissolve. He made a vow. Nadir, I will not. And you know what? The other companion tied himself to a pole in the mosque. He said, no one will untie me unless Bilal comes and steps over my neck. So look at the wisdom of the Prophet He said, oh Bilal, step forward. Bilal stepped forward. He said, step on this dirt. So Bilal stepped on the dirt. The Prophet took a piece of that dirt and sprinkled it over the neck of that companion. He said, Yalla, your vow has been fulfilled. Your vow has been fulfilled. Go and tie him. The Riwaya says, when they untied one another, they hugged one another and apologized until both of them dropped unconscious. Brotherhood. Brotherhood. Brotherhood, brothers and sisters in Islam, is far greater than any relationship you can ever get to in this world. Forgive one another, overcome the mistakes of one another. If you have an issue with your brother, don't give him your shoulder. No, go to him, caress him, kiss his hand and head, shake hand and say, let bygone be bygone. There is so much hatred in the world today. Let's spread love, love. And they call me Dr. Love. It's okay, I'm Dr. Love. All right? What is better than to spread love in the world today? Right? You know what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said? And I will finish. I told you, I warned you. When I say I finish, I don't finish. So be patient with me. Okay. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said what? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, Should I not direct you to something if you do? You will become lovers of one another. Yani you would admire one another. They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, what is it? He said, spread a word of peace. Say salamun alaykum to one another. Don't say hello or good morning. Because what does hello mean? Imagine someone saying hello and you're selling him wa alaykum al-hello. What is that supposed to mean? <laughs> hello wa alaykum al-hello. What is that supposed to mean? But when you say salamun alaykum wa alaykum salam you know what that means? I, you are telling this brother or sister that I am giving you a covenant of safety and security from my part. Whereby, when I say peace be upon you, it means your wealth is at peace with me. Your dignity is at peace with me. Your honor is at peace with me and your blood is at peace with me. Yani I won't harm you in these four departments. And when you reciprocate, you are also giving the same covenant. 
This is how you spread peace. Not assalamu alaikum here once you turn your back. Banner, do you know this guy? This guy is one, two, three. When where does peace be upon you then? Then this is war be upon you. Eh? When his dignity is not being preserved. And if a girl comes or a sister comes or a brother comes and we know something about him the channels of gossip starts to you know go all high wire huh? facebook islamic world becomes he becomes the facebook talk of every town and then two minutes ago we said salam alaikum brother salam alaikum what what is the meaning of salam alaikum Salamun alaikum is that you are at peace and at protection with me. I will not harm you no matter what the situation may be. So salamun alaikum from me to all of you. If I hurt you, if I harmed you, I have one more day with you. Huh? One more day. Please forgive me. Forgive my outburst, but my outburst were for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is my witness. It's not against anyone, it is for the love of each and every one of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us aware of our own shortcomings and make us among his humble servants. الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنَا وَإِذَا خَاطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا With this I leave you with, uh, with wassalamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah we'll continue fight against discrimination and finish the other three points tomorrow in the last day I have with you. May Allah bless you. Wassalamu alaykum again wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a small announcement. People who want to write down questions first, because they are available. And people who want the microphone, you can raise your hands first. Give an answer to the question on the paper. Anybody want to speak? Oh, mashallah. Ya Sheikh. Wa alaikum al ya. Salam. May Allah bless you. Tomorrow is the day of Quds, the day of the oppressed. Would appreciate if you could kindly throw some light towards the importance of this day regards our respected Dr. Hussein Kanan. Who denies the importance of the day of Quds? If we really are the supporters of Ahlul Bayt, remember what Imam Hussein did in Karbala. Right? Any oppression is worthy of our cries. Any oppression is worthy of our support. Whether that oppression is happening to our brothers in Palestine, or Africa, or any part of the world, we must stand firm and never give up on calling an oppressor an oppressor. No matter where, where that oppressor comes from. Because we know for a fact that this country has created against the will of its people. I don't know what United Nations is on about. Okay, because the United Nations never honored any of its decisions. Huh? Why is it only when it comes to that particular place they want to honor all of a sudden that decision of the creation of the state of occupiers? Huh? And that is unacceptable. So it is at least, the least we can do is go to our Facebook, go to whatever venues we have. I don't know what sort of activities you carry in this country in recognition of this particular day, but it is worth, worth voicing our opinion and our intellectual thought and our ability to articulate our denouncement of the creation of such unjust state. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. Can you suggest some quality translation of the Holy Quran in English by non-Muslims, Sunni Muslims, Shia Muslims? Well, by non-Muslims, I would say the best that come to mind is um, uh, what's his name? Yeah, uh, Alhamdulillah. Huh? Pictol. Pictol. Ahsan. Pictol. For non-Muslims, Sunni. The best translation that I can think of, uh, I wouldn't say Abdullah Yusuf Ali, and I would say one of the old translation of the Quran or interpretation of the Quran, if you can get your hold on it, your hand on it, and that is Tafsir al Razi al Kabir. Okay, if you're looking for English translation, modern English translation of the uh, Muslim world today from a Sunni perspective, I would say. Um, 
I, I really have to think about it seriously who I would recommend from uh, the Sunni uh, school of thought. Shia uh, uh, Muslims, I would say Arapuya. Believe it or not. Because he was an amazing translator of the Quran. Not only an amazing translator of the Quran, but he was an amazing person himself. He was an amazing... His thoughts on human interactions were unparalleled. Unparalleled. Okay. Allahu Akbar. This is a newspaper. The importance of Hajj need not, emphasize, not, need not be emphasized. Then what is your justification for repeated Hajj? In Dua Abu Hamza uh, and others, Imam has twice supplicated for Hajj this year and years to come. He also performed several Hajj as well. If you dissuade repeated Hajj for saving billions of dollars, then how Umrah, Ziyarat and holidays of Ziz are justified? Beside, a colossal amount is uh, incurred for lavish wedding and parties and for uh, Muharram rituals. Are you suggesting change of direction in application of our, uh, I don't know the last word, for some other purpose to elevate the status of Ahlul Bayt school of thought? I'm not suggesting any of this. And I think with all due respect to the brother or the sister who wrote this question, they totally misunderstood what I said. When I speak about repeated Hajj, I'm not ignoring the fact that we spend lavishly on other things. Right? But I quoted this as one of the things and major things we can curb and overcome poverty with. I'm not saying don't go to Hajj again. I'm saying if you can, give your due right in a, uh, sorry, give Allah's due right in money of what you have earned to the poor, which is equivalent to that you spend on a hajj a second and a third and a fourth time, then go a million times to hajj. No one is stopping. What I'm saying is that in context of all this, if we don't need to spend lavishly on any of this, then we should take all this into perspective. Yani if you want ziyara once, why do you need to go ziyara twice and three times? If you want to hajj and you performed your hajj of Islam, why do you need to go three or four times? When you do a wedding, why do you need to spend more than you spend on your hajj or ziyara trip? That's what I'm saying. I'm saying look at the whole picture. I'm not saying exclusively hajj or changing the atmosphere of hajj or changing the riwayat of Abu Hamza Thumali and other riwayat of Ahlul Bayt. I'm not saying this. At the end of the day, brothers and sisters, I'm a Muslim. <laughs> I'm not an, uh, yani, someone who does not belong to the community or does not belong to the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. I am hardcore follower of Ahlul Bayt. And I love Ahlul Bayt more than I love myself. But I'm saying, let us read the ahadith. Then how do you justify if in Dua Abu Hamza Thamali, the Imams always say, Oh Allah, grant me the ability to do Hajj once or twice or every time. And in the Duas of Ramadan, Allahumma rzikni Hajj, hajj Baytika fi Aami Hada wa fi Kulli Aam. Right? We are crying for Allah for that. Then how do you reconcile this? Huh? How do you reconcile this with the statement of Imam ja uh, Al-Baqir when he says to save the face of a family from the humiliation of begging is worth in the eyes of Allah more than 70 performance of Hajj. How do you reconcile the two? You reconcile them by understanding the whole picture at hand. That if we want to eliminate poverty, then we have to cut expenses in anything that we have at hand. But that does not mean abrogating, abrogating the recommendation of visiting Ziyara or visiting the house of Allah more than one time. I'm not objecting to that at all. I'm saying take things into perspective and take things into wholesomeness when we study the economic system of Islam. Because 
because the economic system of Islam does not have one standard pattern. It depends on the community, the society, and the time you find yourself in. And that's how you have to draw your economical system in that regard. We have been discussing that we should connect with God. Please, can you give us a few ways how to do that? First and foremost is prayer. First, first and foremost is prayer. Mediation. I'm not talking about yoga. Okay? I'm talking about real mediation where you seclude yourself. Because you know what? And bring yourself to account on a daily basis. That's how you connect with Allah. Look at the munajat of Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib. When he speaks to Allah, it's like a friend who is so intimate speaking to his friend. Allahu Akbar. When he speaks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in dua kumay, look at Imam Ali appeals to Allah. But when you read these duas, read them with understanding. Not so that I can finish the dua because I have an appointment in 15 minutes. Right? No. If you have an appointment in 15 minutes, then don't attend dua kumay on Thursday night. Read it on any other night. Because the Prophet ﷺ or Imam Ali when he told Kumail ibn Ziyad, he did not specify th Thursday night. He said, read it every day if you can. And if you can't, at least once, a, once a, a week. And if you can't, then once a month. If you can't, then once a year. If you can't, once in your lifetime. That's what the riwayah says. Why? Because he wants him to read it with an open mind. So he could benefit and derive the fruits and the jewels of what this dua is is all about that's how we can connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we seclude ourselves all the imams brothers and sisters have told us was laysa minna ahla al-bayt man lam yuhasib nafsahu fi kulli layla he is not among us followers of Ahlul Bayt. Don't call yourself a follower of Ahlul Bayt. These are not my words. These are the words of our respected Imams. If you don't sit at night by yourself on a daily basis and you go through the daily activities of your actions. That's how you connect with Allah. You say, you know, Ya Allah, I'm your servant. Yes, I know I slipped, but by Allah, I have no one to turn to except you. You know, this reminds me of a joke where a person was caught stealing. So his boss said, you are stealing from Allah's money. You have no shame. He said, who else I'm going to steal with if I don't steal Allah's money? Wallah, I went to shaitan. I lured him a million times to give me one penny he refused. So I turned to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to, to get it. Turn to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not by stealing his money, of course, right? But I'm saying, connect with him on the medium of prayer, in the mediums of dua, in the mediums of what? You know what is one of the best medium of connecting with Allah? Voluntary work. Voluntary work. When you realize how people are living, it's the best way to connect to Allah because then you realize the na'ma of Allah on you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us through the Quran when He said, What? وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نَعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا If you sit and count the na'ma of Allah on you, you will never be able to count it. But you know what we do instead? We sit and count the bad moments in our life. Instead of counting what? The good moments in our life. And if you begin the process of being positive, not negative. That's when you find yourself. That's when you find yourself and you find that tranquility. And above all, that connects you with Allah in an amazing way is when you read the Quran with an open mind. When you read the Quran on the basis of wanting to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, I have a lecture. It's called In Search of Our Souls. I have 12 points in that lecture that tells you how to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I wish I had time to discuss this particular topic with you of how to connect with Allah on a grander scale in that regard. But inshallah, I'm hopeful against all the odds huh, that I will be back inshallah to this beautiful country. I don't know and I don't care what people say about Pakistan. All right? But let me say this. Do your level best to bring this country into shape because it's really shameful and it saddens us to see it going in that direction it's going in. Let's invest in our children so that they can become the future leader and bring some peace and sense into this world we are living in. Is it true that if the saying of the Fajr name... <coughs>
you go back to sleep. The naming is batil. I can't understand. Is it true that if other saying, I don't know, but it's not saying that. Ah, is it true that if after saying the Fajr namaz, you go back to sleep, the namaz is batil. Namaz is batil. Ah, no. No, no, no. You can pray and go back to sleep. There is no problem. But there is some ahadith that says what? That says it is highly encouraging to stay awake after Fajr namaz because this is the time when your sustenance is being divided. So when you are sleeping, <laughs> you are uh, missing on your proportions uh, or on your rations, godly rations. Uh? In fact, uh, there are a hadith that says, that exclaim, I don't know how people get sustained when they sleep after Fajr. Huh? So it is because it's a good time, it's a golden opportunity. Even if you go and study Hausa, for example, the best time they say to study is after Fajr Namaz. And that's when our first lesson begins. You know? After Fajr, because the mind is clear. There is nothing to pollute it. That's the time you should stay up. But to do that, sleep early. Huh? Sleep early. Don't say to the Layl at 3.50, Salaamun Alaikum Khuda Hafiz, and go to sleep. You're not going to wake up for Fajr over my dead body. Huh? No one is going to wake up for Fajr at that time, right? Unless we train ourselves. Is beat Sunnah for all men as hijab for women? Now if it is Sunnah for all men as hijab, firstly hijab is not a Sunnah. Hijab is a wajib act, right? And if anyone is hinting at me, okay? Let me tell you from here, Malish, I take it, I have thick skin, all right? I don't grow a bead, meaning I don't have hair to grow a bead, all right? La hawla wa la And if I had, trust me, I would grow a bead. All what you see is what you get, all right? So, if someone, because you know, it is unfortunate that once on Facebook, a whole debate ensued for three days over the Sheikh's beard. <laughs> Students as far as Qom were into the debates. This marja says this, and this marja says and this, and I am sitting watching. Wallah, and the whole debate is about me. This Sheikh should not be listened to because he is not following the Sunnah of the Prophet. Ya Akhi, have mercy on me. First, send a question to me. Say to me, why don't you have a beat? Firstly, I do have a beat. Right? At least I'm keeping what I can keep. Right? But how sad it is for the whole youth community over the world to fight over the Sheikh beat for three days. We don't have something better to discuss. What's going on with Muslims? Huh? What's wrong with us? We have taken the superficiality of Islam and left the core of Islam. We are debating the beat. When we need to debate poverty, debate education, debate killing in the name of beat. Right? In the name of beat, unfortunately. And kill someone because he does not wear his, I don't know what, shalwar kameez above his uh, ankle. Huh? Hajib. Someone is praying in a mosque and the Imam finishes his prayer. So the Imam turns and says, Taqabbal Allah. Someone sitting behind him says, Bid'ah. He said, I'm telling you, Taqabbal Allah, you're telling me Bid'ah? I'm saying, may Allah accept your prayers. And you're telling me this is an innovation? He said, yes. He said, so ill manners is sunnah? He said, ill manners is sunnah when your brother is making dua for you. You say, I don't want it. Is this part of sunnah? Is this what the Prophet wants us to do? Is this the ethics of the Prophet wasallam that you fight against the superficial aspects of our religion in Asfa. And then, let me see those who are talking and making an issue over the bead. All maraja of taqlid say what? Bead is wajib, right? But all of them say the haram in as far as the bead is concerned is to shave it by a razor. 
So if you trim it by a bead trimmer and you don't use the razor, even if it is as thin as the, you know, the, the bead trimmer, I'm not saying the electric shaver, so I don't get misquoted, uh, the bead trimmer, it is still considered keeping a bead. So don't go for what is big, go for what is useful. The whole idea behind keeping a bead is what? Is to create that sort of a fine lane separation between what constitutes a man, yani masculinity and femininity. We want ladies to be feminine and men to be masculine. Islam wants that. Why? So that there will always be that attraction between men and women. But wallah, if a man grows his hair to his back, he, sh he shave, he clean shaven, and a woman is standing next to him, also her hair to the back, and she's also clean shaven, then how do you separate between them? Right? That's the idea behind Islam. The idea, be you want to keep a long beard, it's your derogative. Right? As long as you ascribe to the minimum requirement of what our maraja say. And by the way, some maraja say that even shaving the bead with an eraser is not haram. But it is more mustahab not to do it. Not to do it. I'm not here to justify it. I'm here to say expand your horizon in regard to these issues so they're not, we do not become pedantic at these issues. Rather, let us talk about the major issues that are affecting our community today. I don't know. Inshallah. What about what? What about cousin marriages in Islam? Uh, Islam says you can marry a cousin but it is recommended according to doctors, maraja of taqlid, ayatullahs, that if there is any chance in that family from prior, prior experience that there could be some sort of problem in the formation of the embryo, then it is highly recommended to take a blood test first. And if the blood test comes negative, then don't marry that cousin. Don't then go to istikhara, because it doesn't make sense, because knowledge is telling you it is a risk. It is a risk. And still, you want to take an istikhara, it's up to you. That's your belief system, I, uh, yani the belief system of the individual at hand if he wants to salam. Do you think that it's okay if, if migrate from this city considering the current situation without having the resolution of coming back to reform? Just migrate for self-safety. You are much more better to understand and to identify the reasons why you want to migrate. I can't give a fatwa on this. You don't require a fatwa. You used to use your logic and your, you know, uh, uh, human intellect to see what is best for you in that uh, regard and in that situation. You said that on the day of judgment, the malaika will say to the oppressed, why didn't you migrate? However, what if it wasn't possible for people to migrate, i.e. their country is blockade in Gaza? Yeah, I'm saying within the means, yani when the malaika, brothers, please, when the malaika are speaking to these people, are they speaking about the people of Gaza? Don't they malaika know that these people can't travel? It's common sense, yeah. Yani the malaika, they're gonna go to the worst blockaded people in the world and say, you know what? Why didn't you migrate? Yeah, you pick someone else where they are at liberty to migrate. Yeah? They're not gonna go just to the people who are blocked in one place and say, you know what? I feel like picking on you today. Why didn't you migrate? No. no, brothers and sisters. We're talking about the general sense of the ayah and how we can put the ayah into perspective. What is the significance of dreams in Islam. Has it got anything to do with the journey of our soul while sleeping? Any relation to reality? Absolutely, absolutely. The Quran speaks about dreaming as a reality sometimes. Not all dreams are a reality. But Allah says what? Allah says those souls that Allah has not determined for them to die, what happens? Allah brings them back into the body. And those that their time is up, God holds these souls back, not to return to the body. 
So what is the interpretation of this ayah? The interpretation of this ayah is that the longest dream that lasts according to scientists is how long? Six seconds. The longest dream is six seconds. And you think it's an Indian movie, right? You think that a dream is an Indian, three and a half hours you are seeing this dream from night until morning, when in fact it's six seconds. But how do you justify the time? It's this ayah, that in fact it is not you in your physical body seeing the dream. It's the soul that departs the body. And when the soul departs the body, it has no limitation of time and space. So it travels all around the world, meets certain people, dead or alive, and comes back to show you that dream. Because it's the soul that is traveling and not your body. And that's why the dream is six seconds. That's why the dream is six seconds, because it's the soul that travels, right? And sees things. You see yourself on Hollywood, the next day you are meeting your grandmother in Najaf. The last day you're coming back here, you have been to marry for lunch. Allahu Akbar! All these six seconds, yes, because the soul has no limitation when it leaves the body. And that's the significance. And dream, and dream in fact, according to the Prophet, is one part of 37 parts of prophethood. Yani prophethood is consisted of 37 parts. One of these parts is what? Dreaming. Yusuf, what did he do? He dreamt. Ibrahim, inni ara fil manami anni adbahu. But don't come ab an Ibrahim of today. Go and tell, you know, son, I saw that I was, uh, forget it, go to sleep. Huh? Because you're not a prophet. <laughs> you're not? Oh, well, I feel like sacrificing you for the sake of Allah. Oh, you are Ibrahim all of a sudden, huh? No, this does not apply to you. We conclude with the last question. As a mother of toddlers, I find it difficult to pray namaz with concentration. When kids are around and, uh, and get something, I, uh, 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 and... I don't know. I want them to see me pray and learn from me. I lose my focus. Please advise. Don't do it all the time. Huh? Yeah, and you want to train your kids to see you praying. Select certain times when they want to see you pray. And, and, don't do it with the obligatory prayer. You want your children to see you do the sunnah prayer. Nafila. You know, that's a good time. But when it comes to the obligatory prayer, so you want your concentration, put them to sleep or put them with the maid or let someone else take care. And I'd rather, if the father is around, that the father take care of the baby instead. Huh? And then pray your obligatory prayer for concentration. But when it comes nafila prayer, inshallah Allah will accept because he knows your intention is to train your toddlers and there are other means. By the way, I recommend a book for everyone to read. It's called Concentration in prayer it comes with a CD I don't know if it's available in Pakistan but it's an excellent exercise of how to gain concentration in prayer may Allah bless you assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh